topic I would like to touch upon is one that will come upon us all sooner or later. It doesn't matter whether we are rich or poor, male or female, black or white, we will all come to suffer from the hand of time and deteriorate at some point. And this leads to the process of aging. Indeed, nobody likes to age, but we will all have to face the consequences at some point. When I tell people that I work on anti-aging research, and especially the wealthy people are interested, because it's one of those few things that they cannot yet buy their way out of. But, in fact, aging is a problem for society as a whole. As I would like to show you, for instance, in this graph, population age is on the rise. This is something that has happened since the Industrial Revolution. We get older than our children, than our parents, our parents get older than their parents, our children will get older than us. What you can see here in this graph is, for instance, uh, the average population age of two points in time. One about a decade ago, and one uh, for the next generation. And as you can see, uh, the average population age is projected to inc increase from about 40 to 45, a decade ago to 65 within the next generation. That means we'll be having a lot of old people and less young people to take care of those old people. That in itself is not so problematic, but as we also know, with age, we get more and more likely to get, to get diseases. This graph shows, for instance, a range of diseases, all of which incline with increasing life uh, expectancy. This means that by the end of the, the next generation, we will be stuck with a lot of old people in a very poor condition. And therefore, the goal of my research has been to see if we can actually find ways not just to maintain lifespan and health span, that's been you know, done before by eating less and exercising more, but can we actually restore health span, for instance, by providing a way of partially rejuvenating aged individuals. To do so, we first have to understand a little bit what are the processes that underlie aging, and here you can see a late a fellow countryman of mine, Raymond Verrine, self, various self-portraits, and as you can see, uh, well, he aged over time, but for, at that time, definitely it was not known what were the underlying causes of aging. We still don't fully know all the underlying causes, but we definitely know that there are a multitude of, of causes. And we think actually that, cause, that damage to the DNA is, for instance, one of the major reasons why the cells in our body age. Each day, every cell in our body gets damaged about 50,000 times, depending on the location and the time of day. Fortunately, all those damages are typically repaired. But every now and then, some damages remain. And we think that as those damages remain, as we go older, we accumulate more and more damage. And as a consequence, such a cell can enter a state of senescence. So the question then is, are those senescent cells maybe a driver of aging? And if so, can we then eliminate those senescent cells and thereby potentially provide a way of rejuvenating the body? So just to show you a little bit about what this senescence process is, it's actually a an effect that can happen in all cells that are irreparably damaged. The cell doesn't have to be actually damaged, it can just think that it's damaged, but essentially that leads to a, uh, a process causing the cell to be permanently withdrawn from the cell cycle. So senescent cells can no longer divide. That's a good thing, because you don't want damaged side cells to go rogue. So in itself, senescence uh, is, a, is a beneficial process. It can pre prevent cancer, for instance. However, these senescent cells have a side effect in the sense that they secrete a whole range of proteins, and they do this all the time. So senescent cells, we are born with them. For instance, moles, we are born with moles, they're all senescent, and we die with them oftentimes. But we accumulate more and more of these senescent cells over time, and that means that we continuously build up a chronic level of secretion of molecules. In a transient state, senescent cells can be beneficial. So for instance, if we cut our cells, we get around the site of injury, we get these senescent cells. They secrete all these factors, and those factors aid in the wound healing process. That's good, because then the wound closes, and then the senescent cells disappear because of the immune system, and everything goes back to baseline. However, like I said, as we age, we get more and more of these senescent cells because the immune system is less effective in eliminating these cells. And as a consequence, we think that senescent cells over time, because they're not eliminated, because they continuously secrete all these factors, are drivers of many age-related diseases. And they range, for instance, from cancer, so the pro progression of few benign cancer cells to malignancy is enhanced by senescent cells in the environment of the, of the cancer. It can lead to all sorts of uh, bone and muscle and joint-related diseases. It can lead to decline in tissue function, 
metabolic diseases like diabetes and neurological diseases like Parkinsonism, for instance, and many, many others. This list is actually too big to, to put on one slide. We know that this, oh, that's necessarily our association with diseases. Uh, can we then also do something about these certain cells? That's the, that's been the research of my lab for the last decade or so. Um, it started off with looking at what's different then in a senescent cell versus a control healthy cell. This is the DNA of a senescent cell in blue. On those senescent cells, there are sites of permanent damage. So like I said, all cells in our body get damaged every now and then, but as a result, those senescent cells, the damage remains. So in the purple and red color, you see the damaged clusters that are there forever in these senescent cells. We find the protein to be present there in green. This is the FOXO4 protein. And using ultra high resolution, uh, microscopy. So there, uh, in ultra high resolution microscopy, we were able to identify that this FOXO protein <coughs> locates at those sites of damage. We figured that if you can break these clusters, maybe you can selectively now eliminate these senescent cells because normal cells don't have these clusters. So we designed a, a drug, a, a piece of this FOXO4 protein, it's then called a peptide, to eliminate these senescent cells. Um, here you can see on the left healthy cells, control cells that should not have these damaged clusters. And on the right, you see these senescent cells. And we incubated both uh, cultures, cell cultures, with a dye that turns green when the cells die. And as you can see, only the cultures containing the senescent cells turn green. So we have designed a drug that allows us to selectively eliminate these senescent cells, at least in a cultured con condition. Is it then also applicable, for instance, to animals and eventually to humans? In our lab, we make use of mice that age faster than normal, so they're an accelerated aging syndrome. And as you can see, for instance, here you can see one of those mice at half year of age. That's roughly equivalent to about 30 years of age in humans, but it looks already aged by loss of hair and all sorts of tissue dysfunction. It, it actually crouches a little bit like humans do at old age. And as you can nicely see, the treatment of, the, of these mice with this anti senescence drug causes the hair to regrow. This was actually not something we were purposefully looking for. It was actually just an, an, a side effect we noticed. It was difficult not to see. So that was very encouraging, because it seems now that by removing these senescent cells, we may actually counteract aging. So for a long time, we have only <coughs> been able to stall aging, but this could actually be a little bit of a rejuvenation. We also looked at the behavior of these mice. And um, you can see now two mice, they are, they are sisters of the same age, from the same uh, breeding couple. Uh, and you see that the untreated animal, like all humans, they are not so mobile anymore. If you put them in a cage, just for this movie, you put them in this plastic box, young mice explore the cage, old mice don't. But you see the treated animal hit, actually, it started moving around again. So not just were we able to regrow some of the, fina, the fur of the animal, but we actually restored some of the behavior as well. So this really looks like we are improving, re-improving the health span of these aged animals. To quantify it a little bit further, we also can put mice in cages containing running wheels. Uh, mice run at night, so when we are not around, that's a good thing. And I have no clues starting this study how often mice run, but it's roughly around 10 kilometers a day. Just to give you an impression, that's 40,000 cycles in a, in a running wheel. So they do that every day. If you put them there for months, they go crazy. Um, but you can see the aged animals run about one-fifth to a tenth of that. If you now treat these animals uh, with this drug for a, a couple of days, you see that they control young, healthy animals. They don't change their running wheel behavior. It just stays at 100%. But if we do this in the, in the aging model, you can see that there was actually restoration of running wheel capacity. And this was voluntary, so we were not around. So, we were very excited about this because it seems that, that there's a restoration of function on animals. We also looked at organ function and also those uh, improved. So for instance, we can restore kidney function. So the kidneys fi fi filter all sorts of junk from the blood. And actually that restoration goes down over time, like it does in humans, it does so in mice. And with this drug, we could restore those functions. So that means we finally have a drug uh, that can actually be set back the clock maybe a little bit. And we are not the only ones doing this. There are several other groups studying ways to restore and extend health span. And there are a few mini revolutions ongoing right now. So for instance, there are groups that have actually shown that you can actually wipe out the damage on the DNA itself. So then you don't have to kill those cells. You can maybe just 
restore them, the cells themselves, into a healthy state. There are also groups who are able to take um, differentiated cells from the body and make them temporarily into a stem cell. And if you do that in mice, also the mice live longer. All of just, just to indicate that not only are we the only ones doing this, but there are several groups around the world which actually, are now, in the last two years, have shown that there are various ways of restoring function in mice that have already gone bad. So actually that means, if this is happening in the lab right now, not all of it is applicable, within a generation it will be applicable to humans. And what could that mean for humanity, for instance? Here you see, for instance, the lifespan curve uh, for human society at the moment. It has a certain shape, but is it then possible to not just only extend uh, the, the shape of the curve, but can we maybe make it more squared? So for instance, just a little bit of expansion of life, so maybe let, that we could all reach 120 or so, I think that's the oldest that people have ever gotten so far, but that we only get sick at the age of 119, for instance. That would be the goal, right? So there are also, of course, people who would like to live thousands of years, but that's, that may be true, but it's still difficult uh, to envision being realistic in the coming years. This is much more realistic. What this would mean, and that's what I would like to end off with, if this is applicable to humans, then we have to start thinking, as a society, about these questions. At what cost would we do this? Right now it's about 80,000 euros a year for a quality of life year. Should we pay for that? And how often can we give something to humans then? I think actually healthcare costs may drop if we are able to, uh, to get people healthier for a longer period of time. At what risk would we do this? If we, let's say, those senescent cells, they can ev occur everywhere in the body, also in our brains. So maybe our neurons can become senescent as well, which is where our memories are stored. So could it potentially be that we rejuvenate our bodies at the cost of losing certain memories? Would we be willing to take that risk? And last but not least, what would this have for a consequence for society? Right now, we are already 7 billion people. Uh, Retirement age is going up to about 68. I think this will become unrealistic to maintain in the future. It's, it's naive to think that these developments will not be implemented on humans uh, in the next decade or so, in the next three decades. So we should do something about retirement age. Should we give people a chance to develop a second career? Should you maybe go back to school at age 50? Next relationships, whatever. How about overpopulation? How do we deal with that? These are all questions that I think we now need to start addressing because we will have to have the answers within the next generation. Thank you.